When you're making a bet on Tesla, you're making a bet that they do develop truly functioning autonomous vehicle technology, and they should get there. If, if they can't get there, I'm not sure who can. The minute you waver, if you wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh my God, can they really do it? Then it's too risky a stock for you. There are some very big questions that people have about Tesla as a business and as an investment. For example, what's the best way to measure the true valuation for Tesla as a car company or as a tech company? What will Tesla need to do to grow and maintain their dominance in electric vehicles? And which of the other automakers are likely to survive? Today, we're very fortunate to be speaking with Nick Colas. Nick is not only a 30-year veteran of Wall Street with experience in equity research, money management, and investment banking, but very uniquely, he also has a background advising the auto industry. During the 90s, he was a senior equity auto analyst at First Boston, now Credit Suisse. He both led the equity deal that saved Chrysler in 1991 and led the first auto company in China to IPO. In 98, he helped the sale of Chrysler to Daimler. Today, he runs DataTrack Research, which publishes a morning briefing newsletter read by thousands of investment professionals around the world. Nick is regularly on CNBC and Bloomberg and is widely quoted in the financial press. What a real honor for us to be speaking not only to a financial analyst, but to someone with a real background in the auto industry. Nick, thank you so much for joining me. This is something I've been waiting for for a long time. Appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much. And it's a true honor to be here as well. You built a great franchise looking at Tesla, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Nick. So, you know, I uh, there's two big topics I really want to get to right away, uh, which is, how do you value Tesla? You have this very unique approach. This is a big conversation amongst us Tesla investors. Uh, you will walk us through your, your thinking about it. And then the second thing is, why is it that Tesla is so much more valued market cap compared to all the auto companies? And you have a very good feel of why that is. But before we get there, tell the audience here a little bit of your background. Um, I read a little bit at the beginning there, but boy, you have so much that uh, you bring to the table here. So I think it's important for us to walk a little bit through that. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, uh, I started looking at the auto industry in 1991, working for uh, First Boston, later Credit Suisse, and I was a senior auto analyst there. And back in the 90s, being an analyst was a lot more like being an investment banker. So I spent most of my time doing investment banking deals around the world, primarily equity deals. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, we raised $140 million for Chrysler to uh, basically save the company in November of 1991. We were literally wiring money out of the settlement account to suppliers <laughs> so they could build the Grand Cherokee. That was how how dire the situation was. In 92, I went to China and helped IPO China Brilliance Automotive, which was not only the first Chinese auto company listed on the NYSC, it was the first Chinese company of any type. And then in the mid-90s, I did everything from raising capital for General Motors and Goodyear uh, to taking public the first rental car company that later bought budget rent-a-car, as well as helping on the IPO of Hertz. Also did a lot of auto parts deals. Uh, we took Ducati public in 1998. And one of the bigger deals that I worked on was actually helping sell Chrysler to Daimler in 98 as well. That was a huge M&A transaction in the auto space and really began to shift um, how people thought about how companies around the world needed to group together in order to survive in a very, very difficult industry. So my background there was really advising the auto companies. I then went to SAC Capital and worked for Steve Cohen for three years as a portfolio manager and analyst looking at the auto industry as well. And that really opened my eyes to how traders and, you know, very thoughtful people think about this industry. That helped me a lot. I learned more from Steve in three years than I did working at First Boston for nine years in many ways. It was just hugely you know, influential in my thinking. After that, I went back to the brokerage industry, built a research department, then moved to another firm and did market strategy for 10 years. And for the last six years, um, my business partner, Jessica Rabe, and I have been running Data Trek Research, which is a daily market newsletter. And the most important part of it in terms of how we think about the world is our disruption section. And that's what really got me thinking about Tesla, not just as a car company, but as a true disruptive tech company, which it obviously is. And the intersection of all these experiences kind of leads me to being with you today. <laughs> I love it. It's so fun because uh, there's just, I, I think you can get really, really, really busy uh, very, very soon. Not that you aren't already, <laughs> but your background, right? So Chrysler merge, uh, raising money and merging. So there might be more automakers, as you explained to us, might what how you think that what's going to happen to the world of automakers as we move forward here. To you actually helped the IPO of a Chinese car company back then, right when China had no car industry, but now they are becoming a force. 
And then three, even your uh, partnership or kind of your experience with Hertz, because if we do get into auto uh, to to autonomy and uh, you know robo taxi, Hertz might play a big part on that. And then, of course, your data track research today, which are deep in, deep dive into all that. So there's just, there's so much here I want to dive into. But my audience is primarily Tesla investors, and a big debate that I have with many of my friends uh, who are all bulls, we're all you know Tesla bulls. We see the value of Tesla, uh, and then of course we always bring in the bears as well. But you know the big debate for us is how do you value Tesla? How do you see it? How do you how do you determine what a, what a fair stock price is? Um, and so you you have a very fun or kind of a very holistic approach of how you do this. Please uh, share that with folks. Sure. So the way I think about Tesla, let's just sort of break it down. Tesla right now is worth around about $700 billion in terms of total market cap. That's the value of the company. And it's a big value, but it is, I think it's justifiable from a number of perspectives. The way I look at it is twofold. The first is what is the value of any car company on the planet that we are sure is going to survive the transition to electric vehicles? And to my mind, there's only two, Tesla, obviously. And then the other one is Toyota. And it's not just me that thinks that. The market cap of Toyota is roughly $300 billion. It's the only other car company in the world that has a market cap consistently over $100 billion. That tells me that the market thinks Toyota will survive. And I happen to agree. I've toured Toyota plants. I know the operating model very well. They are the low-cost producer globally. So we have two car companies that will survive, Tesla and Toyota. Tesla's obviously got a much bigger valuation, 700 instead of 300. The incremental $400 billion, very simply, is the value of autonomous driving. It is recognizing that Tesla has made tremendous strides in autonomous vehicle technology and will continue to make more. And it's the assumption that there is some, what I would call call option value, not an equity value per se, but a call option value on Tesla becoming the premier provider or a premier provider of autonomous vehicle technology. Both of those numbers, rather though, that latter number is a bit squishy because obviously AV technology is worth a whole lot more than $400 billion when Tesla gets it up and running. But that's the way I bucket the Tesla valuation. And it comes down to the value of a survivor in the industry, which we know Tesla will be, and then this value of autonomous vehicle technology. And right now it's very volatile. You know, as you probably know, call options are much more volatile than stocks in terms of price. That's why Tesla is so volatile because in many ways that value of the call option moves around a lot every day, just based on the whims of the market. But that's the way I think about it. We have two buckets, the survivor buckets, which Tesla will be. And then we have the AV bucket where Tesla is clearly in the lead. And the combination of these two things makes for the market value of the company. Okay. Yeah. So it was one of your uh, YouTube videos that you did, I saw that you said, okay, PE ratio is a good way to measure the the value of a company or discounting from future uh, value to present value is a second good way. But the third way is to think of it like a, an option play, because you know that if one of these big things happened, whether it's energy, whether it's robots, whether it's a uh, robo taxi, in your case, you're pretty bullish on the autonomy part then you value it based on that, right? Just a, can you give us a little bit of, because this is so critical for people who many of us are like going, what's the PE ratio? And here's the, the you know earnings for share for this year, next year. And let me go ahead and tell you what the PE is. And that's my value. Um, is that the way to do this? Uh, I think many people do, and I, I can understand why PE ratios are a long established way of looking at valuations on Wall Street. But at the same time, you know, for example, PE ratios are not really just about the earnings. They're also a judgment about how long the company can make the earnings and what mm -hmm. is the return on capital for the company. So if you think about PE ratios, not just in terms of one or two or five year growth, but how sustainable is that co competitive advantage? How successful is the company? How much money does it make for every dollar of revenue? That's really what drives PE ratios. It's why big tech is why Apple has a over market multiple PE ratio because its competitive advantage is so strong. Tesla's in a very similar position. Now, one can argue whether a 60p multiple is right or a 70 or an 80 or a 100. That gets to be a very cloudy conversation. And I don't think particularly instructive. That's why I break it down into the value of the company as a survivor and then the call option on something else. And we see call option valuation in a lot of different parts of the disruptive tech world. So any cryptocurrency right now is basically a call option on something. For Bitcoin, it's an ETF and uh, financialization and investment merits. For Ethereum, it's the value of smart contracts 
contracts. So there's a lot of optionality in disruptive technology valuations. And as a Tesla investor, one has to get comfortable with that optionality because it does create volatility. That's okay. That's just the nature of the beast. Okay. So I will ask you, because you said something earlier about Toyota going to be one of the survivors, which I just cannot understand. And we'll hear your uh, perspective about that. Uh, but let's talk about Tesla some more. So, you know, for them to be a survivor, I think we all believe that they are survivors, as, as we can see, not only a survivor, but the, the number one leader for these revolution electric vehicles. Believe it or not, I know you know the auto market better than I do, but there's so many people who think that that EVs is just a niche. Okay, so Tesla's going to, but they, you know, you saw the earnings call and you saw Elon warn dramatically about the potential, and he just has PTSD of 2009, or is it 2009 or 2000? Yeah, 2008, nine when many companies went down, and then 2018, and he wants to protect it. So he was talking about. Um, they raise, they put in three more billion dollars of cash, right? To now twenty six billion, and when we had a conversation prior to the earnings call, you were the one telling me that you actually think Tesla should raise money, which is amazing because in this in in our my community, this community of Tesla investors, there was a debate about buybacks. There's a bunch of people who think that Tesla should be doing buybacks right now, and not only did you say don't do buybacks, but you're saying they need to raise money. Can you uh, tell tell me why you were saying that even weeks before exactly what uh, Elon was? Not, not that they're going to raise money, but at this point, they're talking about needing to shore up their their, their finances even more than they have now. Yes, yeah, so we can do this in two parts. So let's start with the micro. What's Tesla's financial situation right now? And as you said, they re actually increased cash by $3 billion, but only a billion of it or so was from cash flow from operations. The other $2 billion was incremental debt, non-recourse debt, but still debt. So that's why the cash balances rose. The way I think about any car company, and for the moment, we're going to treat Tesla like a car company, because for the moment, in terms of recession risk, that's what it is. Um, car companies have to fund their CapEx and have to fund operations even when demand goes down. And it's one of the most critical things about understanding about this industry is when demand declines, car companies start to burn cash very, very quickly. And in Tesla's case, they can't really afford to defer capital expenditures. They have to keep investing and growing the technology side of the business. So they're really in a bit of a tough spot because they have roughly $10 billion a year of CapEx. They can't not spend that money. And they have roughly $10 billion a year of general operating expenses. And again, they really can't defer any of those. They have to keep investing and growing. So that $26 billion in cash goes away pretty quickly if you start to see declines in demand from a recession. And we'll talk about competitive forces as well, but let's just talk about recession for the moment. Elon's very right to worry about car, a car company in a recession. And he does have PTSD from 08, absolutely. But that's a healthy perspective in this industry. So if demand declines and cash flow begins to go negative from operations, they have to continue to keep funding everything, particularly the AV side of the business and all the other technology things they're doing. And so I think the wisest thing for Tesla to do right now, while the stock price is still extremely high, is to go out and do a $20 billion equity deal. It's only a 3% dilution to the value of the company. It's basically nothing. EPS numbers get cut only very, very small. So there's really not much risk doing it. And by adding another $20 billion, you bulletproof that balance sheet. And the number one thing you have to do as a car company to survive in the near term against any kind of exogenous shock is make sure you have all the cash you need. Look, it's the only reason Ford never went bankrupt. Because in 08, GM and Chrysler did. The Ford family was wise enough to tell the CEO, raise all the cash you can. And that's why Ford is still a public company, still controlled by the family, because they did that. And I think you know, Tesla can take a page out of that book and understand that you really have to be very, very conservative with cash and have as much as you possibly can, not just for the recession risk, but for the risk that the industry develops in an unhealthy way. And we can talk about that next. But as a point of reference, we want to have Tesla have as a bulletproof a balance sheet as absolutely possible. And raising $20 billion doesn't hurt the current equity holders hardly at all, but materially improves the liquidity of the company over the medium term. <laughs> Raising billions, which uh, I'm very open for. Uh, oh, this is fantastic, Nick. Uh, this is, you know, very clearly there was this debate that was going on in the in the, in, the, in the, my community talking about buybacks, and you're like realizing this is the economy that we're in. 
not only do they need to shore their finances, it's not enough. They need to raise more money. Um, so uh, what was your kind of thinking about what happened in January of this year where they did massive price cuts of the cars? Where tr I've been trying to educate folks and let, let them realize that when to, to, in 2018, when the Model 3 was released and in 2020, when the Model Y was released, um, the prices today is the same as it was when they first, first released. They went up only because of this COVID supply chain disruption that happened. And then they just brought it back to where they were at that time. But people think that they cut prices. They have this massive margin that they had that they, in lieu of margin. And then there's some people who think they should be advertising right now. So comments on, on your thoughts on all this. Sure. Let me maybe take an overarching or a big picture view of that question. And then we can drill down into the particulars of what's happening this year. The most important thing to understand about the global auto industry is there's 40% more capacity than there is demand. So mm. it varies by product line, but this is a tremendously overcapacitized industry for a whole variety of reasons. But basically, capacity doesn't leave the system when companies lose market share. Um, car companies are very important employers in a lot of countries, and a lot of countries don't want to see car companies and shut down plants. And so they give them incentives. They give them, they give them different financial incentives and other social incentives to keep plants open. Open. You know, so for example, GM went bankrupt during the financial crisis and the U.S. government basically bailed them out and helped them out of bankruptcy. Um, that capacity could have left the system, but it didn't. And so we still have more capacity for car production globally than we have demand. That creates a very unhealthy dynamic because you have basically too much supply chasing too too little demand for the capacity that's installed. And that's why the industry has very low returns on capital. So as a result, it's very hard to make a good margin over time in the car industry because it basically you're competing with way too much capacity. The other issue, and this is particularly topical for electric vehicles, um, and just to give you a little bit of background, there are obviously, as your as your audience knows, mandates for how what percentage of electric vehicles each car company will sell in five or ten years' time in the U.S. and Europe. And there are some mandates in China right now that will no doubt grow. It's a big part of the EV bull story. We've tried this before in the U.S. <clears throat> with something called corporate average fuel economy or CAFE. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what CAFE started to do in the 1970s was mandate how many, what, what average miles per gallon a vehicle fleet had to be. So if a car company wanted to sell cars in the U.S., their corporate average fuel economy had to be, call it 15 miles per gallon. And it's gone up to 40 and 50 now. That dynamic was supposed to encourage the the sale of small, efficient vehicles. The trouble is gas prices are very low in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. And so you ended up with a situation where small cars, it became very unprofitable. And only the most efficient car companies like Toyota were able to sell small cars at a profit. The domestic car companies slowly receded out of that business to the point where it's almost impossible to buy a passenger car from a U.S. automaker anymore. They just don't make them anymore because they got competed away and out of that business. There's a lesson here for the EV industry, and, and Elon Musk understands this crystal clear. You have to be the low-cost producer in a market where your product is being mandated because consumers have to be attracted to the product enough to buy it versus an alternative. And for the next many years, they will have alternatives. They will be able to buy an ICE vehicle. So if you are a car company selling EVs, you have to be the low-cost producer, and you have to keep cutting price. The two things go hand in hand because you have to pull consumers into your showroom and have them signed for a car. And that takes price and, and nothing else really will do. So as much as there have been price cuts in EVs, there probably will be more. And it's why it's so critical that, you know, Musk and Tesla are very clearly focused on being the low cost producer, because that's the way you survive is being the low cost producer. And the cafe example shows you that if you don't do that, GM, Ford, the old Chrysler, now Stellantis, if you don't do that, if you're not the low cost producer, you will not be able to compete in that marketplace at all. And then that's the death knell for those companies if they can't. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com. Okay. I mean, yeah, so I've always, many of us agree that you need to bring the price down until it's price parity with gas cars. And now cheaper, like you're saying, obviously they're going to introduce lower set price segments like the compact car mm -hmm. and all that. But now that we're here, because electric vehicles is so new and there's a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of disinformation being shared by 
many industries, the oil, the big oil, the big media, the big auto, they're all kind of just hammering EVs and Teslas. Do you, what's your thinking about advertising? I mean, they should be educating folks, right? Um, but right now, Tesla is just dabbling in it. And then Elon just yesterday said that they're going to expand their advertising. But what's your opinion about that? And what have you seen work in the car industry? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So on the advertising point, I mean, car companies are some of the largest advertisers in the country. And there's a kind of weird societal fact about that. Um, in the US, the time between somebody thinking, okay, I need to buy a new car, when they walk off the showroom or drive off the showroom floor with a new car is five to seven days. It's a very short cycle time. And the problem is you don't know when that will occur in the given consumer you're trying to target, which is why you have to advertise so much. I mean, car companies just advertise everywhere on TV and on social media. And it's because they have to hit somebody in that critical window uh, of that five to seven days where they first think, okay, my lease is up, I've got to buy a new car, or my car needs too many repairs, I'm going to buy a new car. And they've got to get on the consideration list in that very narrow period of time. Now, this has not been an issue for Tesla so far because this product's basically sold itself. But as they grow and as they you know, you'll want to continue to sell more cars, they probably do have to advertise just to remind people, hey, this is a viable, attractive, opportunity, a valuable, attractive product that you can buy instead of an internal combustion engine car that will save you money over time, provide a better experience, and you know is good for the planet. So all those things combined do make advertising kind of a necessity, but it's a bit of a quirk to the U.S. market. In Europe, for example, it's very different. Cars are generally sold um, to production. So if you walk in and want to buy a new Volkswagen in, in Germany, you'll most likely tell the salesperson, I want this, this, and this in the car, and they will be produced for you. So there's less of an inventory issue there and a little bit longer cycle time. But in the U.S., it is quite important to advertise. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, I'm gonna we're talking we're gonna talk about the auto industry and there's so many good questions here. So I just want to start at the highest level, which is what's your view about electric vehicle exponential curve up? And what's your view about ice decline? When do you think that there will be that crossover? Will there be equal? And when do you what do you think by 2030 the percentage? Um let's start with that question and then I've got a one that's follow up right on the same topic. Sure. Yeah, so <laughs> It's a very hard question to answer, you know, because we do have the regulatory backdrop that tells us what the percentages will have to be over the next five or 10, 15 years, both in the US and in Europe. And we have some examples in China about how that works and how that can grow quite quickly. So to me, the question is, you know, not when the crossover point is, although I think it's going to be, call it five to seven years out, seven to eight years out, somewhere in that range. But the critical question will be, twofold. The first is how price competitive are the cars? If EVs are substantially cheaper, the adoption curve will go much more quickly. You know, what I always write into our customers is, you know, consumers have a choice in this matter. The government can say you need to produce these kinds of cars, but consumers have a choice about whether or not they want to buy them. And it's the cafe discussion that we had earlier. Just because you tell some, tell a car company, you've got to produce vehicles of a certain type, doesn't mean consumers have to buy them until the price is right. So the second part of this is how quickly do EV prices drop to encourage a consumption? So I think the crossover point is is coming. I'm not super worried about whether it's five, seven, or ten years because I know the government's going to be governments in Europe and the US are going to mandate it. So that's fine. To me, the interesting question is what price points get consumers into the cars. And that is a very hard thing to know. And even the established car companies know it's a hard thing to know, which is why they're producing mostly large electric vehicles right now. Look at the GM lineup, for example. They're focusing on vehicles that have a very high pricing umbrella over them because the internal combustion engine perversions are so expensive to begin with. As we move down and sell more volume, we've got to get into passenger cars. We've got to get into smaller SUVs. And that'll be where it's very interesting to see what the profit margins are and what the pricing has to be. And I don't think anybody has the answer to this, which sort of goes back to the comment about Tesla being wise if they raise some cash now. Because if the pricing um, situation is more dire, more difficult than we think it might be right now. We want the company to be able to spend that money to get to the end point. There's an old saying in motorsports, in order to finish first, first you must finish. Mm -hmm. And that is every car company's goal right now. And the trouble is not, no company has the competitive advantage that Tesla does. 
among the among the incumbents and so they're going to be competing on price versus anything else that's a very toxic environment so i think the adoption curve is fine my question is what's the price to acquire that adoption curve right right okay so i have this favorite chart that i will post up here which uh shows that in 2030 so you just said right in five to seven years you're saying that that's maybe when they cross over so you're saying 50 percent of all new cars sold likely going to be electric vehicles by 2030. Um, there's this beautiful chart where if you take all of the car companies, we're talking Tesla, BYD, the Chinese car companies, the European car companies, and all the legacy Detroit Big Three, and you plot their their own estimate of what, how many electric vehicles they cho- they plan to have by the end of 20, at 2030, it actually adds up to 80 million, <laughs> which is... The number of cars sold per year. The problem is not every one of them is going to hit their stated target of 2030. So if you think it's going to be 50%, but there might be a gap where many car companies are not going to be able to fill this. So there might be this weird thing, right? What do you think might, do you think that that could happen? Or do you believe that the demand for ICE vehicles will last longer than people like me think? Yeah, there, it's it, it, funny you raise that point because even in the 1990s, one of the sort of in, inside jokes that every anal- all the auto analysts had was you took all of the car companies' market share assumptions for the forward year and added them yeah. up, and it would always equal to 130 <laughs> percent every <laughs> single year. Every car company had misestimated their share by one to two to three points. Some were even five. GM was off by five points in some years in the 1990s. So. Nothing, not at all surprising that we're still living in the same dynamic today. So, you know, it, but again, it speaks to this question of how do we get to this end point? We know that the demand is going to be there if the price is right. We know that governments are mandating that these vehicles will be produced and sold. And the question is, what is the margin structure that gets us there? What is the pricing structure that gets us there? You know, there's also another famous chart that shows the market cap of every car company in the world, and it adds up to whatever, and that's the same as Tesla. That's another way right. of saying, you know, yeah. how do you know how do we get to that in state? And it's <clears throat> only one company seems assured of having, you know, a viable product and a viable business when we get to that end state. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I saw that clip of you. That's fantastic. You, you the 12 car companies on one side and Tesla on the other side in terms of market cap, and you basically said dead <laughs> a lot. It's as simple yeah. as that. That's great. Now, we'll get to Toyota because you said that the reason why the market believes Toyota will survive because of the market cap that they're still giving Toyota. Before we get to Toyota or the big three, I got to ask you about China. So you uniquely helped an IPO of a Chinese car company way back. And I think it was a minivan you said. And that was just a regular car company. But now they're getting into EVs and they've got the BYDs, they've got Neo, they've got quite a number, Li Auto, and uh, they've, they're now not only is very successful in China, which is a leader in electric vehicles, but now they're going into Europe and they're starting to create beachheads there. Any kind of background or experience you have about the Chinese car companies and what's your thoughts about them? What's going to happen with them in the world? Yeah, actually, I was in a BYD showroom in Paris three weeks ago um, and you know went through the product in a lot of detail, talked to salespeople. It is, you know, they are competent products, you know, in terms of being able to compete. Price points are a bit high right now because they're trying to figure out the pricing. That'll probably come down over time. The products are good. They're not great. Um, And this is going to get a little bit auto industry nerdy right now. But one of the ways you tell the quality of construction of a car is you look at the width of the seams between the door and then the panels that are attached Mm -hmm. to the 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 outside of the vehicle. The wider those seams are, the lower the quality production. So if you look at a Mercedes or a Volkswagen or any German car, those seams are tiny. They're three two, three, four millimeters. The gaps on Chinese cars are uniformly larger, which tells you that they're doing an okay job because the seams are pretty even, but they're not really yet at Western or call it European quality standards. The same is true of the interiors. The interiors are functional, but the materials are quite a bit plasticky, feel a little bit cheap, not as nice as a Tesla, for example. Um, So they're coming in with a 
reasonable product at a pretty high price and then they'll figure it out they you know want to see who's interested in the product at that price for the cup price but the quality of the product is not quite yet to western standards it, it will get there over time for sure just like the Japanese did in the 70s and the Koreans did in the 90s, the mm -hmm. Chinese will, will get to that high level of global quality. You know, the broader picture is the Chinese companies have operated in China with, you know, a lot of mandates and a lot of support from the government. And the government sees it as a critical industry, which is absolutely correct. But again, the question is, do they all survive? You know, we can sort of draw a parallel to the world of the Internet, uh, where you have two internets in the world. You have the China internet and then you have the, the Western internet. And I wonder if we're going to have the same kind of dynamic when it comes to vehicles, particularly to electric vehicles. Are we going to have sort of a Western dominated set of companies and then China lives in its own world? It doesn't mm. allow as much competition as otherwise. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think the Chinese companies, bottom line, are, are viable competition. They're going to be low price competition eventually. And we talked about why that's so important. Uh, but they're really just one other player in the game. They, they don't really have, I think, the same level of assurance of long-term survivability as a Tesla does, for example. They're kind of right now, and the market agrees with this, they're kind of in the same bucket as a GM and a Ford, which have a lot of economies of scale, but don't have a big EV product product line yet. They're better on the EV product line in China, but the question is, can they scale globally? And that's a really important thing for the car industry. Most car companies are highly successful, Toyota being one example, have a global footprint. Ford has a global footprint, probably too global, but at least they do have a global footprint. And the question will be, as we transition to EVs, can you survive as a non-global car company because you don't have the economies of scale of being able to sell that many units? Wow. Okay. First, I heard it here. Okay. So you're saying that China is going to be successful in China may not be able to, you're not convinced they're going to go global. They're, they're heading, they're heading into Europe. And my understanding is they're going with the premium product first, because they want to be seen as a premium product. And that's why the prices are still high. Eventually they'll start doing, you know, flood them with the cheap cars and people are price sensitive. Um, so I, I always assume that they are going to go global, maybe not make it to the U.S. because of, you know, incentives and taxes and so forth. Uh, factories need to be built here. They're not automated. They're not making a lot of money, but at least they are profitable, like tiny little bit of profit versus every other car company, um, Rivian, Neo, the Legacy 3, they're losing $33,000 or more per car still. So, okay, interesting that you you... You're thinking that China succeeds, but not yet convinced that it's going to go global. Yeah, because, I mean, if you look at the playbook, the standard playbook for the auto industry is the classic Clayton Christensen disruption model, where you start at the low end of a market with a product that fits an underserved community. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you move up the market, providing buyers with higher quality vehicles that fit their needs. And then slowly you take over the world. So the Japanese came in the 70s with cheap, small cars that were needed right. because of the fuel crisis and then moved up scale. The Koreans did exactly the same thing. Okay. It's very yeah. odd to start at the top and move down. Only one company did it. That was Tesla, obviously. It started with an expensive product, but to an underserved community, people who really wanted a pre premier, premium, luxury-style electric vehicle. And then they went down, driven, driven by the cash flows from those vehicles. So Tesla's been able to do it. That's one reason why the story is so unique. It really breaks some of the, of the model of disruptive innovation. The only other company over time that I think has done it well is Apple. Apple always starts with kind of a premium product and then goes down, but their brand supports that. Tesla's the same way, but in general, disruption works from the bottom up, not from the top down. You just mentioned Apple. Uh, I would always assume that this is the same thing that's going to happen here. Tesla's going to be the Apple, and then Samsung and Android, you're going to see the Chinese take over, the, become the Android of the car business. How do you see that playing out? You know, it's tough to compare what are essentially software and hardware companies in many ways. So um, it's certainly possible, but someone's still got to make the car. And making a car, as we discussed, you know, this industry is, you know, profoundly challenged. And it's not going to change anytime soon, just to sort of round out that thought, because it applies to this conversation. Every car company knows, every car company CEO, board, shareholder base knows they've got to get to an all EV future. They also know that if they don't, they will fail. They will literally 
go into liquidation and go away or sell the brands for a dollar to some more successful car company. And so every car company is going to be incredibly competitive over the next 10 years to make sure they make it to the end point. And if they don't, they go away. That puts a lot of pressure on the industry. It puts a lot of pressure on margins because you have this already very difficult industry going through an important technological change and knowing that if they don't do it, they fail. So it's really a do or die situation. And then the Chinese companies are, are just caught up in that as well. They have to compete. They can compete on probably production costs. But you mentioned that they're trying to sell premier products. The products that I saw in the showroom in Paris are not Audi or Mercedes mm. or even high-end Volkswagen no. levels of quality. So you can't charge that price and not deliver the same level of quality. And so they've got to bring price down fairly quickly if they want to grow that beachhead. All right. Let's get to the fun topic, which is the auto industry. <laughs> Tell me who's going to survive. You've already said uh, Tesla will survive and thrive. You said Toyota. And I'm like shaking my head. <laughs> I don't understand. And then I think you've said, and well, you can tell me all the others who you think is surviving. And then we can also do a deep dive into the, uh, the, the Detroit three, but let's start Toyota. Uh, they are by most measures, the last in current, uh, uh progress with electric vehicles. They, f the, the, the Toy Toyota himself, the grandson was kicked out or he finally quit saying that they aren't able to, you know, th this is a new world and they've been slow to start. Um, they were trying to do this model with the factories where they were going to have all three different kinds of cars in one factory. Like I can make you a hybrid, I can make you a gas car, and I can make you electric vehicles, even hydrogen, all the same. And then they retracted and said, oh, we realize we can't do that. Now, I do know that last year they say that they have a gigacasting machine, and then they showed kind of a prototype where they're going to follow and copy Tesla with the uh, unbox model. They've hired Joe Justice, who I've had on this channel many times before. He's famously known for the agile ex uh, expert in Tesla, and you know he's been hired there. But Tesla, Toyota is the largest incumbent. They're the they're they're the, the you know what I mean when you're like the largest incumbent, it's really hard for you to turn on a dime and then switch to a new revolution of a new technology and you can see that they've been delaying it they've been making announcements but don't really make moves so okay sorry mm -hmm. that's my perspective but you're saying i am wrong <laughs> which i believe well, you <laughs> i would put it two ways you know obviously you know no one's you know it's way too early to know if we're wrong but i'll tell you why i come to the conclusion first of all knowing toyota and knowing the auto industry toyota is the low cost producer on a global basis. And that is a tremendous competitive advantage. And they do it with a number, so many different ways that it is truly impressive. So an example, in the 1990s, and I think it might be even be true today, Toyota would let you tour any plant they, they had, and any, any other auto industry executive could tour any plant they had anywhere in the world on a week or two's notice. You couldn't like going down to the shop floor and ask questions, but you could walk around the facility if you wanted to. And that's because their secret sauce was embedded in their supply chain. They knew how to run a supply chain better than any other car company in the world. And so that ethos still exists to this day. When they put their mind to something, you don't want to get in their way. Um, low cost producer, high quality products, very high quality products. And so from a heuristic standpoint, knowing what I know about Toyota, I would never count them out. And people have tried to count them out over the last 30 years, and they've always been wrong. The second thing I would say is that the, the stock market tells you that this company is a survivor. As I said, it's the only car company with over, consistently well over $100 billion in market cap. That happens for a reason. It's not a mistake. Um, that is very much the capital market's perspective that this company is a survivor. For example, it also has a single A credit rating. Um, not many car companies still have one. So their cash flow is still quite strong. Their balance sheet net of cash is still quite strong. And the last thing I'd say about Toyota is if you look at the long term stock price charts on any car company, Toyota, Ford, um, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, Volkswagen, Honda. Very few look like Toyota. Toyota has actually grown in market cap over the last 10 years at roughly a 5% compounded rate. Not as good as the stock market, right? So not a, not a name you want to own for the long term. But if you look at Mercedes, when we sold Chrysler to Daimler-Benz in 1998, the stock price was 90. The stock price is currently 60. If you look at Ford, it's back to where it was in 1997, I'm sorry, 1987. 
Mercedes is the same way. It's amazing that the, the, the capital markets usually get these things right, and they've gotten the car companies right. They're not value creators. And so their long-term returns are extremely poor, with one exception, Toyota. And that's because of the low cost structure, the engineering expertise. And so I wouldn't count them out. I totally mm -hmm. take the point that they're late, but this is not a company that you want to just sort of say, well, they can't get it. They're too big or they're too dumb or they don't understand EVs. When they put their mind something to something, they get it done. So I wouldn't count them out. Okay. You're, <laughs> I have to rechange. I'm glad I'm having this conversation about what I had assumed was the world. So, you know, Tesla's number one. Who's next? Who's next? Who's going to survive? And then, then after you answer that question, uh, tell me why they're the, the next ones, and then we can get to the uh, the big three auto and advice you might have for these automakers. Sure. So, in terms of survivors, we have to separate sort of separate a brand versus a company, because brands survive. If you look at Stellantis right now, which is basically the old Fiat, Opel, so forth, plus Chrysler. Brands survive. The question is, do companies survive? So there will be Fiats around in 10 years. There will be you know, Chevys around in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. The question is, who owns the brand, who operates the brand, and what does the brand actually sell? So as far as brands go, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, BMW will be around forever. And that's probably true. The question is, what does that brand mean and who makes the vehicles? The companies that would put sort of towards the high end of the list in terms of surviving, Mercedes, obviously one very strong brand, very good engineering. They're behind, frankly, in some technology, particularly AVs. We can talk about that. But their EV technology looks pretty good. And I see the vehicles rolling around now in New York. So they're getting some traction. BMW is another one. BMW is actually controlled by a family, the Quant family. And so family-run companies tend to survive through almost anything because the family stewardship is multi-generational. In the U.S., you know, I worry about GM a lot. Um, and I want to see them succeed. I want to see them make this transition. But like Ford, they face a lot of structural challenges. Ford, also family-controlled, again, in a very difficult situation, hard to see what their path forward is over the long term. Again, they have a track record of success in living through big transitions, but this is going to be a tough one. In terms of the Japanese makers, we talked about Toyota, I think Honda, a strong enough brand to survive. <laughs> Mazda kind of on the bubble, frankly. And as you go to the sort of the more mass, 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 producers like a Volkswagen back in Europe, again, they have a pathway, but it's difficult to know how you get to that low cost producer status without some meaningful changes to the way labor and management work together. Uh, Stellantis has a number of very strong brands. Ironically, that stock trades the cheapest of any car company, it trades like three times earnings. So I think that's probably too low, but at the same time, I understand why the market's worried about basically a portfolio of companies or a portfolio of brands cobbled together to create what is now a very good operating model, but over the long term might be challenged to really direct all its energies to EVs and eventually AVs. So the sort of the bottom line is it's very hard to call who's going to be around. The brands will be around. I don't have any doubt about that. The question is, will the companies that we currently associate with those brands be in the same condition they are today? And I mean, the sort of the net answer is no, but it also will involve how much governments want to support the industry. Yep. You know, You've also mentioned, though. No, sorry. I was going to say Volkswagen is 20% owned by the, by, the, by the state in which it operates. GM has been bailed by the GM and Chrysler got bailed by the, by the U.S. government at least once. So it's hard to say, okay, they're going to fail outright. They might survive in some form, just not in the stock price or the stocks or the equity system that we know today. Okay. You've also mentioned it. Uh, previous conversations, BYD and Hyundai Kia. Want to talk about that? Yes. I mean, so BYD currently certainly has a good competitive advantage. Um, and in terms of their lock on the Chinese market, I think quite strong. Hyundai and Kia is a very, another very tough call. They don't have a large organic local market in South Korea. They do have a better market in the US and, and to some degree in Europe. So they're probably I would classify them as also on the bubble, but they do have very deep local government support. So they should make it in some form. Interesting. Most people I've been talking to think that Honda Kia is next to Tesla. So this is very good conversation. All right. So the big three, the big Detroit, uh, they are in the middle of a UAW strike. 
let's say that that's been settled, what advice would you give these three? How would they turn it around and be able to, you know, just become a force and not not go bankrupt? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a, it's a it's a really th- interesting question. I mean, the advice is kind of the same as you would give advice to any car company as they were going into a recession. And we're not going into recession, in my view, over the next year. But the advice is largely the same, which is you have to cut every dollar of cost. You have to get as efficient as possible. You have to raise cash from every source possible and really focus on being as lean as possible, <clears throat> selling every car you can. I mean, I think the UAW strike is extremely damaging to this goal because those car companies are missing out on profits today and tomorrow and the next over the next week and month as production slowly gets shut down. And that's money they will not get back. There will be some pent-up demand when they reopen, but car buyers will go somewhere else. As we talked about, the average lead time is five to seven days. If you don't have a car on the lot, you can't sell it, and the consumer is going to go buy it from somebody else. So they've got to fix the UAW strike quickly and then just be as ferociously cost focused as they can possibly be. You know, one thing I was also thinking about and sharing with clients over the past couple of months is they should absolutely consider spinning off their EV and AV operations. You know, GM entertained Mm -hmm. that thought with Cruise and then decided not to do it. Um, Ford has a bunch of assets in that could be bucketed into a separate company. And I think there's a really missed opportunity here by not spinning those companies off and creating a separate source of capital in terms of a capital raise through an IPO and secondary, um, secondary stock sales that allow you to keep cash coming in the door for those very important projects, even if the U.S. economy or global economy turns down and car sales decline. That's a super large missed opportunity. And hopefully they'll change their minds soon because they really need to do it, but they should really at least strongly entertain that possibility and and explore it deeply because it's going to be an important source of capital that they're currently not going to have any access to. They need your advice badly, quickly, soon. Okay, so... You know, let's talk robo taxi and autonomy. You meant you used the term AV, autonomous vehicles. Um, you you know, electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. We've heard Elon say that, you know, that uh, that it, the value of the company is worth is based on auto uh, autonomous vehicle capability. And I think what he meant by that is saying that if another car maker is able to solve robo taxi and they start making cars that are regulatory approved and able to do you know autonomous driving then all the other car companies, like, why would you ever buy their car ever if it can't do this capability? And then then, then there's a debate uh, that some people think that there's two debates, but let's start with the first one, which is uh, that robo-taxi, that there's going to be plenty of room for everybody, and, but the first to scale is going to have the, uh, is going to win the most. Uh, tell me what you're thinking about autonomous vehicles. Yes. So, you know, <clears throat> actually, um, Elon's comment about the car, about the company being mostly worth the, the AV part of the business is kind of how I started to think about the Toyota versus, you know, Tesla valuation approach. And it, it fits his paradigm exactly. He's absolutely right. The value of this company is in autonomous vehicles. As far as what happens when a company or several companies get to sort of fully autonomous and can pass it through regulatory bodies and be approved, it is, I think, a winner take most or possibly a winner take all situation because, as you said, the applications for autonomous driving are so widespread and not just in passenger vehicles and trucks and other items, other, other ways of transporting people and, and goods that whoever gets to the finish line first has a huge competitive advantage and it's worth multiples of the you know gap between Toyota and Tesla's valuation that we currently see in the stock market. It also depends on how quickly sort of number two comes along. If number two is five years behind number one, then yes, number one's going to get a massive amount of market share. If number two is concurrent with or a month or two or five, six months after number one, then there's a viable duopoly. Um, The one thing I'd say is that it is a fantastic challenge. I mean, you know, I remember five years ago, people were thinking autonomous vehicles were a year or two away. And I remember being very skeptical about that idea because I live in New York City and I've lived there my entire life. And all I know is that if you saw an autonomous vehicle as a pedestrian, you would walk right in front of it because you know it's going to stop for you. And it would take an autonomous vehicle about three days to get from Midtown to the Wall Street District because there's mm-hmm. just 
so much congestion in the city. Um, so AV is a really tough challenge, but I do think you know whoever gets there first or a strong second will dominate the entire market. It's going to be very hard to catch up because it's such, such a profound engineering challenge. Okay. And I think I heard you say that you think Tesla is in the lead there. Um, and then tell me about what you think Tesla is going to do. So you and I had this conversation that do you, do you believe that Tesla will continue to sell cars once they have RoboTaxi? Yes. So I, I think you can guess from my take on the auto industry that the auto industry is not something that you want to compete in if you don't have to. There's kind of a mental model that I think about, which says the reason Tesla started making EVs and started then providing autonomous vehicle functionality and is gathering data is purely to have get the data to build the model to do autonomous driving. And once they get to that endpoint, it makes very little sense to make cars because you're still stuck in the car industry. It makes a lot more sense to then take that software, take that package and sell it to every automaker, sell it to anybody else who, who wants it for any other related use. Not only passenger cars and light vehicles, but heavy duty trucks. So once you have a core technology, why do you need to make cars? Just let somebody else deal with the car manufacturing and the business models around robo taxis and everything else and just sell that software. Because that software is going to be sort of the most powerful software tool since, you know, the first things that came out on PCs. It's an almost unimaginably important technology. So why do you want to make cars after you develop that that system and crack that code? Well, I think the argument is that, you know, Tesla's mission is to accelerate sustainable energy. They, he has said that the factory is the product. And so maybe some people are considering that they can sell factory or sell uh, the technology of factory to as many car companies as possible um, so that you can have as many cars out there that can do uh, robo taxi capability. And that's the fastest way. To prove it, but yeah, I, I, it, I am on your side there. <laughs> yeah, it, it may be the fastest way to, to do it, but the most profitable way to do it is to be a software company. I mean, that's sort yeah. of indisputable. Software margins are orders of magnitude higher than manufacturing margins, and as a public company with shareholders, they should, in theory, be looking for the highest return on capital projects and only engaging in those. That's sort of mm -hmm. what, what public companies are supposed to do, and software has got infinite incremental margins, and manufacturing does not. So let's go back to your background. You're doing data track research that you co-founded. You've got this incredible combination of being an analyst, investment banking, work with Steve Cohen, at raising money, but also in the auto industry for so long. Tell me more about data track research and what you're doing today. Yeah, so DataTrack Research is a market newsletter. We publish every day uh, around 9, 10 p.m. Thoughts about the current market environment, thoughts about what's going on in stocks and bonds, commodities, currencies. Uh, we talk a lot about disruptive innovation. We talk about Tesla a lot, obviously, but also other disruptive technologies and maybe the history of technology as well. So, for example, last night's piece, it was the 22nd anniversary of the iPod launch um, on mm -hmm. Monday. And um, the Steve Jobs presentation of that of that launch is like my all time favorite Steve Jobs video, because it's all pre fanboy. He's really pitching his heart out, and the audience is really kind of skeptical about why is Apple getting into music that's not a computer. But it really was the 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 germ of the idea that grew into the current Apple suite of products, which is not just computers, but everything else we might touch in a given day that's really of use to us. So we think about all those topics a lot, and then we, we publish it uh, nightly, and, and that's the product. Nice. So you keep your uh, finger on the pulse of what's happening. Tell me about what's going on right now. The economy, the wars, uh, the trends, uh, what's going on. If, if I'm an investor, what should I be thinking about? Yes. I mean, there is sort of one central issue right now that's dominating everything else and its interest rates because we've seen such a quick increase in the 10-year yield from the beginning of the year to now and it's all been driven not by inflation expectations but by real interest rates so if you take this the number that you see on the screen every day for 10-year yields call it 4.8 percent it's decomposed into two factors inflation expectations and real rates of interest and for many years real rates of interest were either zero negative or maybe plus 1%. Now they're running over 2.5%, the highest levels since 2006 and seven, which tells you that the stock market or the, the bond market is really thinking about where interest rates have to be over a long period of time to meet the Fed's goal of 2% inflation. 
And what it's coming to the conclusion of is saying, well, rates have to be high for a long time on a real basis. And that's very unusual. Like we said, we haven't seen this since 06 and 07. It's very, has not happened at all since. So the cost of money, and, and Elon talked about this on, on the conference call, the cost of money has gone from very cheap to quite expensive. And there's an old rule in stock markets. You never short a new high and you never buy a new low. So if you yeah. own a stock that is going to a new high, you hold on to that stock. And if you hold, if you have a stock that's going to a new low, 52 week low, you sell that stock because momentum is a very powerful force in stock markets. And so you want to be very careful at tops and bottoms. You certainly don't want to buy a new low. You probably want to hold on to a new high. Yields are making new highs, new oh, highs wow. back to the financial crisis. So the market, the, the equity market has no confidence that it knows where yields top out. That's just the way trading psychology works. So until 10 year yields kind of stabilize, we're gonna be quite volatile. Now, the other issue is obviously the Israeli Gaza conflict, which is extremely sad and, and very difficult and hard to watch. And markets see that as a potential catalyst for more geopolitical uncertainty and markets hate uncertainty. And it's a cliche, but the cliche is absolutely true. So whatever happens in the Middle East could potentially shove stocks around quite a bit. So far, things have been very quiet, which is good, but there's just no predicting what happens next. And so you have a situation where you have two uncertainties, this macro uncertainty of what's happening with 10-year yields and this geopolitical uncertainty that we really haven't had to deal with now since the Russian invasion of Ukraine very briefly in March of the last year. But now we have this more pro potentially protracted problem with Middle East tensions and therefore oil prices. On the flip side, earnings are quite good. Corporate earnings are quite good. So the S&P 500 is doing quite well in terms of corporate earnings. Earnings reports are okay, not great, but strong enough to support us. So we have sort of two worries and, and one strong issue. Companies are pretty profitable, but we have these overhangs that are probably going to keep us pretty volatile for a while. Okay. And then looking into the future, what uh, te technologies, disruptive technologies that you follow quite regularly, which ones are you looking at closely? You know, it all comes down to what we've talked about today, our, um, autonomous vehicle technology, super important. And then that's a subset of general artificial intelligence and then generative artificial intelligence. So Gen AI is generative, is a super important technology, and we're seeing excitement around that. But AI generally is the most important theme for the next 10 years. I can't think of anything that even comes close than what we've seen come out of things like OpenAI, ChatGPT, some of the others, and then as well as what Tesla is working so hard on, which is a more generalized artificial intelligence that can adapt to the real world after it's been trained on a lot of large real world data sets. So hugely exciting, an important part of the Tesla story. And I cannot think of anything else more important to focus on for the next decade. Yeah. All right. Not financial advice, but I need you to kind of walk me through. Is Tesla a good investment? And then another debate some people think is that Tesla could be considered an ETF <laughs> because it's 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 got its hands in so many different industries, right? Energy, bots, autonomous driving, cars. They're doing Dojo as a service, maybe. They're going to have an AI division. And then there, there's another 20 other businesses that they're actually in, superchargers right. and others. So yeah, How right. do you see not Tesla? In, not investment saying? advice, <laughs> as you said. No. <sighs> <laughs> let me let me address the final point you raised first and this is just a personal observation i do not like it when companies diversify uh, i do not like it when they have their hands in multiple pies i have seen car companies try to do this since the 1980s and invariably it does not work at one point chrysler owned gulfstream jet you know on the theory that transportation is somehow their business um GM made all kinds of unrelated investments, which usually worked out as investments. They bought um, um, Hughes Electronics and EDS. They bought a lot of other businesses and financially it made sense. They made some money on them, but it really diluted the focus of the company on the core issue of making cars and trucks that people want to buy at, with a sufficient profit margin to reward shareholders. So I'm always leery of companies that get involved in too many things at once because this is a very, very tough business. 
The broader issue on Tesla, I would sum up kind of the way we began the conversation, which is when you own Tesla, you own two things. The first is an EV company, electric vehicle company that has to get from where it is today to a larger level of scale. They have to compete in order to do that. They have to do whatever it takes to get to the end point of being an important electric vehicle manufacturer and producer over the next five to 10 years. So they've got to keep riding the growth curve, holding on to whatever market share they can, increment, increasing their volume, and be staying a relevant, highly important part of the EV industry. I don't have any worries about that. The profitability behind that effort, I, I wonder about. It may not affect the stock price, but I think it's an important thing to think about. The second part of it, however, which is much more important, and this is super critical. When you own Tesla, you own a call option on autonomous vehicle technology. That call option will either explode in value or decline to zero. And when you're making a bet on Tesla, you're making a bet that they do develop truly functioning autonomous vehicle technology. And frankly, I don't get really worried about whether or not that's going to happen in 2024 or 2025 or 2026, because they're clearly on the right path and they're developing a very useful version of the technology with the, with the optical systems. So I don't worry so much about when it happens. I just want to see a steady progress towards that goal. And the, they should get there. If, if they can't get there, I'm not sure who can. So when you own Tesla, you own that call option. That is most of the value of the company. That's most of the value of your investment. And as long as you're confident that that's going to be successful, it's fine to hold on. The minute you waver, if you wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh my God, can they really do it? Then it's too risky a stock for you. So you have to have extremely high levels of confidence that'll work out because otherwise the stock is worth less than it is today, but less than half of what it is today. Okay. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, this is amazing. I've got so many other questions, but I know our time is up. Uh, you have basically, there's at least four in my account, maybe more once I rewatch this, that you've challenged my assumptions. And I really appreciate your background. You come with tremendous credibility. You have both investment as well as uh, auto industry. People can find you at datatrackresearch.com. That's uh, data track, T -T -R -E -K, data track research dot T-R-E-K, com. Check out his newsletter. He's on X also at <clears throat> data track MB. Um, and uh, gosh, there's just so much. But your background is fantastic. I appreciate this so much, Nick. This is this is a fantastic interview. I, I don't know anybody else that I've talked to that has so much knowledge and uh, of the entire industry. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. It's been, it's been a real honor and pleasure to be on with you.